So Exodus chapter 16, verse 21 says this. So they gathered it, it being manna, as we talked about last week, every morning, every man according to his need. Not his want, but his need. Look at this last statement. And when the sun became hot, it melted. What melted? The manna melted. I'm going to read that one more time. So they, the nation of Israel, gathered it every morning. Every man went out and gathered it, the manna from heaven, according to his need. But when the sun became hot, it would all vanish away. It was a daily bread. It was a daily provision. If you'd allow me to add one more uh, nugget of truth to that scripture there to provide some context. Also, Mr. Sheldon, if people went out and tried to get Monday's quota of bread on Sunday or Tuesday's quota of bread on Sunday, it would also decay and rot and be filled with maggots over in the corner of their houses. You know, that's just like us to say, oh, I got to go out and can all I get. Get all I can and then can all I get. I got to save it for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday only to later discover that just as supernaturally as the manna came down from heaven, from God, to provide for humanity's needs, same, this exact same, the manna would rot if man tried to store up yesterday's provision. That'll preach right there. What I'm trying to get at, Nick, is you can't live off yesterday's word from God. The New Testament says it like this, that man doesn't live, Miss Donna Haney, by bread alone. Man lives by every word proceeding or that proceedeth, E-T-H, present tense and future tense. It's telling us that God is still speaking. I don't know if you know that, but God still speaks. The psalmist says that God not only thinks of you, but God speaks to us in every 24-hour day. And the number of his thoughts, his intentions towards us are so numerous that it is beyond numbering. What I'm trying to get us to see is God is still speaking. God is still capable of speaking to our needs. God is still capable of providing for the things that we need of every day in our life. There's just one weak link in the the process. There's only one weak link in this entire system. And most of the time, it's us and our inability or our lack of faith to go out and to gather what God has for us. Or if we do get it right on Tuesday, we want to get Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays and go put it over in the corner and think we can live off yesterday's manna. It doesn't work that way. Supernaturally, it rots as well. This morning, as I began talking to our church once again about a daily dependence, I want to bring up a little bit of our conversation from last week. There are some things that every one of us, I see you back there smiling at me, Jeff. There are some things in every one of our lives that we think we have to have. We think, I think I have to have coffee nowadays. Look, I'm up to two cups, as I told you now. Somebody said, Pastor John, you don't need two cups of coffee, brother. You don't need no coffee. Some of us think I have to have breakfast, or Pastor John's uh, case, you might have to have protein, or some of you think you have to have the news, or some of you think you got to have your exercise regimen. I told you what I have to have. I have to have Brooke. Hello, getting brownie points this morning. But over 15 years ago, I had someone share a quintessential truth with me about being a Christian, about what every Christian actually has to have. What every Christian absolutely has to have is you have to have a daily dependence upon the Word of God. You have to have daily bread. Here's what the Bible says. All we like sheep go astray. Is, any, is anyone familiar with a sheep farmer around these parts? Any, does anyone know anything about sheep? Let me just say this. I'm not, I'm not trying to be snide. I'm not trying to be uh, passive aggressive here at all. But sheep are kind of dumb. Sheep are like, oh, that piece of uh, grass over there looks good. Let me stick my head up into this thing and get that grass that I never could reach with my little short neck anyways, only to get stuck and be like, eh, 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 eh. And we are just like those sheep. We have a natural tendency, the Bible says, to be like sheep, to be a little slow and to go astray. And because we are like sheep and we have a tendency to go astray, we need a GPS system, a God positioning system. We need signs and roadmaps. We need instructions. We need to stop 
at the quick trip every four minutes and be like, hey, how do you get to Orinoco? Because we will get lost between here and Pine Island on the journey of life. What we have to have as Christians is a daily dependence upon the written word of God, also known as the manna from heaven. I want to read Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 4 again this morning because there's a little bit more preaching in there that I left over from last week and I want to double back to today. Exodus 16, 1 through 4 in the New King James translation says this, And they, the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, journeyed from Elam, and all of the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is in between Elam and Sinai. This happened on the 15th day of the month of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Check this out, verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel began complaining as they were on this journey departing from the land of Egypt trying to get into their new Canaanite promised land they started complaining against their leadership against Moses and against Aaron and ultimately even against God verse 3 and the children of Israel said to them oh that we had just died by the hand of the Lord and our own lives in Egypt when we actually sat by the pots that were filled with meat and we ate bread to our full in other words the nation of Israel was saying to both Moses and God we liked our old lives better Anybody ever said that? Like, I liked it better before you started messing around in my life, God, when it was comfortable and easy and I could do what I wanted to do. You weren't messing with my stuff. For you have brought us now out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. So, so, so Moses, let me just break this down right quick. So God is, is taking these people who are slaves who have become, become comfortable in their slavery. Does anybody hear what the preacher's preaching this morning? They were comfortable in their slavery and they didn't even realize they were slaves. And God starts messing around in their business and starts liberating them, freeing them through the voice of a great deliverer from bondage, bringing them out to a new promised land but before they could go from a place of bondage to a place of promise they had to go through a wilderness journey to build their faith and to test them and to build their trust but when they got in the middle of the wilderness journey all they thought was God's intention was to kill them but God had a totally different intention was to build their faith in him in them sometimes we go through things in life that we think is killing us we think God would never bring me into this. God would never do this. This can't be God. He's forsaken me. And all at the same time, God is the one that's brought us into this season. He's brought us to this test. He's brought us to this situation to stretch us, to strengthen us, to develop us, to mature us so that we can grow in him through the process. See, see here's the truth of the matter. All too often in life, we let our connections, our friendships, our good looks, the fact that we know people, take us to places that our character cannot keep us. But what God said is, I'm going to develop you. I'm going to build you through a testing process into a people that are dependent upon me that do trust me, that do love me, that are connected with me so that when I actually take you into the promised land, you can stay in the promised land. Anybody ever been catapulted into a place and then you get there and you realize you didn't have the skill set, the gifting, or the ability to stay there and it wasn't but just a matter of time you were lowered back down out of it? God was trying to do something in the wilderness journey that they thought was intended to kill them, but God knew was intended to build them. You think, it was, you think it was really something in the wilderness to go through the test? Let me tell you where the real test was about to be when they stepped their foot out of the Jordan River and they stepped over into Canaan. And there were kings and nations and cities and territories that they were supposed to divide and conquer making the land of Israel, that's where the real test would be. The real test wouldn't be if they could find water and if they could find manna and if they could have the Red Seas part. All that was preliminary. All that was elementary. All that was training wheels for what was about to happen with the King Og of Bashan, what was about to happen with the Jebusites, what was about to happen with the Amalekites, what was about to happen with all of the ites of their future problematic life. He was trying to build their trust in this season so they could walk in victory in the next season. All right, let me keep going here. 
Here's what the Lord said in verse 4. He said to Moses, Behold, I hear the children of Israel murmuring and complaining and crying. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you as their leader. And this is what you shall do. You shall tell the people to go out every day and gather a certain quota of bread every day so that I may test them. God was testing the children of Israel by sending them a daily ration. You know how he was testing them? I shared this last week. He was testing the nation of Israel to see if they love their misery, they love their complaining, they love their old lives, or if they really wanted his help for victory and provision. He was going to test them to see if you just wanted to bellyache and moan and groan, or if you really want God's help to get you out of the situation you're currently in. And if you want that, it's going to be displayed in your action of getting up every morning and going out and looking for the manna from heaven that I provided for you. Can we talk about this manna? It's like coriander seed. The Bible describes it as something like a vanilla wafer, but it wouldn't give you love handles. Could you imagine waking up every day? Miss Donna Haney, I got to tell you this. I woke up this morning. I got dressed. I pushed a garage clicker. I forgot it was supposed to snow. My wife said to me Friday night, she's like, it snows every Saturday and Sunday. She told me that Friday, like right when we have church. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember she said it. Hit the garage. It came up fresh snow. I said, oh, Miss Donna Haney told me what to do. She said, get my leaf blower when it's fluffy. 5.45 this morning. Vroom! 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 My leaf blower doesn't have a muffler, Miss Donna. I have to wear headphones, uh, like gun shooting earmuffs when I crank. Ask Brooke, and it's got one speed. My, my leaf blower, it's a couple of seasons past being, needing to be replaced, but I'm just holding it out like every good frugal Minnesota. I'm just going to get one more season out of it before I throw it away. It has two, two operations, off and this one. Wah! It's either wide open or nothing. Vroom, vroom. I said, they ain't getting the robe this morning and Adidas flip-flops. My feet cracked last week after I went out there and got that snow under my feet. I had to put lotion on my feet. My feet split apart. I said, uh-uh. Vroom, vroom, vroom. No, I'm just kidding. I said, man, if I crank this leaf blower this morning, these people are going to vote me out of the HOA. They're going to move me up out of here. I took my little shovel. <laughs> Did me four little tire tracks this morning. I'm going to do the leaf blower when I get home. I'm excited. I'm ready to see how it works. But the children of Israel, they would go out every morning and they would look and there would be double stuffed vanilla Oreos that was actually good for them and didn't give them love handles. And God would rain it down every day. And they had to go out there and get their daily need from God. And it was a faith building exercise that built their daily dependence on God's provision in their lives. Then they would, you know, like you and me, they try to get Tuesdays and Thursdays and they stack it up in the corner and then they'd look over and it'd rot and fill up with maggots. And what God was saying, there's no, it's about the process. It's not about my supernatural provision. It's about your trust in me to provide for your everyday needs. You got to do it every day, every day. All right. Now, if you want to be literal, I skipped this last week and I do want you to know one thing. There was only one day of the week that he allowed them to gather for two days. On Fridays, they would be able to gather for the Sabbath day on Saturday because they couldn't work on Saturdays. All right. They rested. So there was no work. <clears throat> Every other day of the week, they had to get a daily dependence, a daily portion of their provision from God. Now, this morning, where I want to go with the rest of our time, let's just briefly recap the five points that we took away from this message last week. Number one, you ready for this? The nation of Israel was on a journey. All right. Number two, we see that the nation began to be frustrated. When they got frustrated, they did what most of us do. When we get frustrated, we complain about other people. They complained against their leadership. They complained against God. All right. I made this statement last week. It bears repeating. Listen, in life, I've discovered it's always easier to blame others. <laughs> it's always easier to blame others. But the reality is if you and I spend the entirety of our life blaming others and never accepting responsibility for our successes and our failures, we will never grow. We have to get to a place in life and say, no, the reason I'm here is because I made a dumb decision. I took a shortcut. I got off track with God when he was trying to lead me here. 
All right, number three, just moving on a little bit further. So we talked about the nation of Israel being on a journey. We talked about them getting frustrated when things got hard. Then we talked about God sending his provision to them. Then we talked about the people's individual, number four, responsibility to go out and gather it daily. What I mentioned here is people have a natural proclivity for others. People have a natural tendency and a desire for others to do the work for them. We, we all have a natural tendency to want somebody else to go get my provision from God. Pastor Mike, tell me how to have a good marriage. Pastor Mike, tell me how to fix my children. Pastor Mike, tell me what thus saith the Lord. Pastor Mike, disciple me. But I want you to notice here in the scriptures that what had to happen is the people had to go out, every man for the household, and gather the provision from God for themselves. It was the man's responsibility to bring home the coriander vanilla wafers, double stuffed Oreos with no fat content in them instead of the bacon. Jews couldn't eat bacon. All right, let me get back on track. Number five, the people doing this was a daily expression of their faith in God. Like when they opened the front door of their tent, they weren't looking for snow. They were open in the front door. Well, they were in a sense because it would come down white. But when they opened the front door, this, is, this has some preaching in it here. You need to hear this. When they woke up, the Bible says there's new mercies every day. Every, when we wake up every day of our life, we should be waking up with an expectation that the God who sets high and looks low, check this out, Jehovah, who is Jireh, he is my provider, the God who sees ahead of me, sees further down my road, already exists in my future. When we wake up, we should be looking out the front door of our tents with expectation for God's daily provision for my family today, for my marriage today, for my children today, for my job today, for my income today. See, I know right now in all these uncertain times and with all of the complexities that have gone on in life, many of us feel like everything's out of control that maybe Jesus has somehow fallen off his throne. But I've got news for you, my friend. Jesus is still squarely on the throne of heaven. God is still in control. You may not know what tomorrow holds, but what you can know as an eternal gift from God is who holds your tomorrow. And trust me, in spite of the world being upside down and inside out, God is still sovereign and God is still capable of providing for you and me, his children, every day of our lives, in spite of COVID-19, all right? So we got to remember that. When we wake up, we don't need to be like, oh, my God. Somebody else go get it for me. Ooh, and Moses is a bad guy. Joe Biden became president. Oop, he said it. Governor Wall still the governor. Who didn't get mayor election? I didn't want to do it. They didn't sing the song I wanted to. We all have a natural tendency to want. My mom didn't treat me right when I was a kid. I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. We all have these natural tendencies to play the blame game and to want to get confused and to want to mully grub and to want to rhyme and gripe and not look with expectation. Well, maybe God forgot about me. Maybe I'm different. Maybe he can't do it for me. When we should be waking up saying, my God is still my provider and he is capable of providing for my needs today. Mentally today, spiritually today, emotionally today, physically today, whatever you need, my friend, God's provision is out there for you. It's just your responsibility to go get it, not mine. <laughs> Sometimes I have a hard enough trouble just getting it for me. <laughs> Somebody said, that's why you the preacher. <laughs> you're supposed to get it and give it. I am, but you're supposed to get it as well. And when we do this, it builds our relationship with God, our trust in God. It declares our faith daily. And then all of a sudden, are you ready for this? That faith starts growing. Well, all of a sudden, all of a, sudden a kid acts crazy. All of a sudden, the boss lays you off. All of a sudden, there's a downturn in the market. And you don't go, because you realize, even though some of you have great jobs at Mayo, that Mayo is not your source. God is your source, and he just uses mayo as the avenue of your supply. Trust me, my friend, you wouldn't have that job. God didn't want you to have that job. The income you get, God gave it to you to see if he could get it through you. 
And when we wake up to the grander reality of that element of faith, that it's not because I'm smart enough. It's not because I'm good looking enough. It's not because I'm connected enough. It's not because I'm the most articulate. It's because God put me in this place. It wakes us up to the reality that even though trouble hit today, my God is still with me. And he's going to walk with me through this valley of the shadow of death. And he's still going to provide for me. All right? So, now, <clears throat> last couple of minutes we have. I want you to get ready to add another layer of notes to this, to this message here. And then we're going we're gonna to call Pastor Chad back. And we're going to close out our time together. Number one, I think you've already gotten this memo, but I'm just going to show it to you from the New Testament. We, too, are on a journey in our life from the bondage of Egyptian slavery to the promised land of our eternal relationship, our eternal dwelling in the presence of Almighty God. Just like the children of Israel, this parallels your and my life. And I think what most of us think is once we get over into the promised land, that everything's over. That we're going to look like little, little babies on a Love's diaper commercial with harps and wings and God's taking care of everything. When in actuality, what's happening is just like the nation of Israel, we are in the middle of a journey. Here's what the apostle Peter said. He said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, And if you call on the Father who without speck of persons judges according to every man's work, then you pass your time here on this earth. So journeying here in fear, what I'm getting at is the Apostle Peter said that our time on this earth is a journey just like the children of Israel were coming out of Egyptian bondage and they went on a wilderness journey. We too are on a journey. What I'm trying to get you to see is this journey here in this life is a faith test. It is a faith exercise to build your dependence dependence upon God's daily provision for you in your life because the truth of the matter is this is just preparatory this is just training baby if you'll read the rest of your Bible for when we step on the other side of the eternal divide when we begin to rule with him when we begin to reign with him this is training in this life on this wilderness journey for when we get over into the kingdom of heaven which is to come to reign with character to reign with integrity to reign with uprightness to reign in truth to reign with equity, to be men and women of God who have this life as a journey experience that built us into the men and women of God we will be for eternity. You want me to give you a scripture to blow your mind? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Now these three abide, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. If you read 1 Corinthians 13, you know what that whole chapter would tell you? That one day the gifts of the Spirit, which have a statute of limitations, will come to an end and will no longer be needed. But faith and hope and love will be used for all of eternity. The reason I'm bringing that to the table today is it's still going to take faith to operate in eternity. You don't like operating with faith now. I don't like operating with faith now. Well, I, I can't see it. I can't see it either. Well, I can't feel it. I can't feel it sometimes either. Well, I don't know how to trust. I don't know how to trust him sometimes either. It's called faith. Here's what the Bible says. We must believe that God first is and that God then is a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. This whole journey right now in our wilderness experience where we're out here learning a dependence and a trust upon Almighty God. As He moves, we respond. As He moves, we respond. As He leads, we respond. We're learning throughout this process called life an experience that builds our faith and trust in Him for the next obstacle, fork, or bend in the road. You ever been around somebody you thought was a giant in the faith? And all of a sudden, adversity hit and they fall apart. <laughs> like, oh my God, wait a minute. You don't have no roots. You don't have no strength. You don't have no maturity. And God, like, like all of a sudden, the, the boss said, you're going to lose 2% over the pandemic. And, ah! You're like, hold on. You're a big grown-up. You're a big kid. 
this process in life, and I'm making it comical and funny at other people's experience through illustrations that have no names and faces attached to them, but the reality of this is every one of us have those areas in our lives where God is trying to woo us and strengthen us and develop us and grow us and build our faith through trust in His daily provision for our lives, and many of us act like on the surface we've got it all together. Many of us act like we've got it all together and working out in our marriage or working out in our finances, but there are areas in every one of our lives where God is trying to teach us a deeper dependence and trust in Him. And the truth of the matter is the only reason I'm up here preaching this today is what we're going to find out is oftentimes it's not thin air when we step out in faith. It's God's supernatural, miraculous provision for all of those areas of dysfunction still in our lives that we haven't had enough faith to trust Him in yet. This isn't that everything's going to be good message. This is sometimes, yes, it's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. But when we step out there in faith in Almighty God, even if it works out differently than we thought it was going to work out, it is still going to work for His good and your glory. It's still going to work out that way. We're on this journey. Yeah, we came out of sin. And yeah, we're on our way to heaven. But it's about the process now of the journey. But most of us want to skip the journey. You know why Sunday is important to me? Because I get to see all of you and go to church. You know why Sunday is also important to me? I don't have to go to the gym today. (laughs) Because I want to skip the journey. But Monday's coming and I got to go back to the gym. It's a journey. It stretches. It strains you. It pushes and pulls. It's tough. I'm not talking about the gym. I'm talking about your trust in God, your faith in God. We like the off time, but the growth happens in the hard time. We like the mountaintops where we can see all the scenery, (laughs) but the development happens down in the valleys. That's where the growth is. That's where the briars are. That's where the buckthorn is, as you guys would say. That's where you get poked and pinched and clawed and scratched and turned around upside down, lost. You don't even know where you're at. That's what happens. See, you act like you've been there before. Yes, I have. Look at this. We are on this journey. And what happens is we get frustrated. Now, I'm going to meddle a little bit right now. And we get, and it's Tim Walls' fault. And it's Trump's fault. And it's the Senate's fault. And it's Biden's fault. And it's, we do the same thing. We're still people. 6,000 years later, we still do the same thing. It's everybody else's fault, right? Can I tell you why complaining is never the answer? Complaining does two things. Number one, when you complain, you step out of God's divine order. God's a God of order. God always said, when, when, there, when there is issue between you and a person, the Bible is filled with scriptures about how you reconcile and work through issues. There's an order to it. And it's not you call the third person. <laughs> it's not you get on Facebook. It's not you do all the things. And we get out of order, God's divine order, and then we open a door, James says, in the spirit world that lets more confusion into our marriages, more confusion into our parenting, more confusion into our hearts. More com- There's an order to it. You don't complain because you don't want to get out of order. Number two, you don't want to complain because here's what you're saying when you complain. Indirectly, you're saying, I don't trust you, God. Because how I had it worked out was the dominoes were going to fall that way, and when the dominoes fell that way, it was all going to work out according to my little plan. And the dominoes didn't fall that way. So I'm mad at you, God. And what God's trying to tell you is, hey, listen to me. You see one domino. I see all the dominoes. And where you're focusing on one falling the wrong way, what I'm focusing on is 64,072,013 falling. And then all of a sudden working something for your good and glory that you didn't even know was working. When the dominoes fell that way, shut your complaining mouth and get back in order with me and trust me for your future. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. Now, I don't have this down. I just got to preach it, right? And it's important that I live it. Do all things without murmuring, complaining, and disputing. If I didn't give you no other scripture today, that's enough right there. Daily dependence upon the word. We all needed that one today. Do all things without murmuring, complaining, and disputing. There's enough for us right there. We forgot that one was in there. That's one of the ones we like to omit. Phew. 
Number three, God has sent you provision. He sent me provision. You ready for it? It's written in red, John chapter 6, verse 51. Jesus said this, I am the living bread of heaven, which has come down from heaven as manna. And if anyone eats this bread, he or she will live forever. And the bread that I give them is the bread of my flesh, which I shall give so that this world can have life. Well, God hasn't provided for me. Wrong answer. That's your viewpoint. It's not the truth of God's word. God's provided for you. He provided when he gave you his son who became the bread of heaven. And he gave it so that you can have life. Matter of fact, John 10, 10 says, so you can have life better than you have ever had it before. Abundantly. Interesting scripture. Check this out. I'll let you decide if it fits or not. It's not a heaven or a hell issue. Revelation 2 and 17, also written in red from the mouth of King Jesus as well. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. To him who overcomes, then I will give some of the hidden man of heaven to eat. If you remove that one comma that doesn't exist in the original language, it seems to be a connection between an ear to hear what the Spirit would say seems to be a connection between an ear to hear what the Spirit would say to supernatural provision manna from heaven for God for your everyday life. So here's what I want to tell you. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't come and have authority to speak on His own. He doesn't come and speak of His own. He comes and He reinforces and amplifies the words of Jesus. For Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will bring unto your remembrance all things that I have said unto you. See, man has already come from heaven. And the man is your provision in every situation in your everyday life. But what's got to happen is we got to get a Johnson & Johnson Q-tip and get it down in our spiritual ears. we got to cut off the news. We got to cut off the chatter. We got to cut off Facebook. We got to cut off the doubt. And we got to get to a place where we can hear the Spirit of God amplifying and ministering the words of the bread of heaven to us to guide us as our GPS system, God positioning system on this road of our everyday journey in life. Well, I don't know what to do. I understand. I don't know what to do either sometimes in my marriage. But what I can tell you is my not knowing know what to do. My not knowing what to do does in no way diminish what God has already done. The reason there's not a lot of applause right now because what's happening is we're all realizing that the dysfunction in our lives God has an answer to. And the truth of the matter is we like our dysfunction more than we like his provision. Don't flatten my tires. Number five, I'm going to let you go. I still got three minutes. I'm ahead of schedule. Oh, number four. It's our responsibility to go get this. It's our responsibility. Look at this. This is what we should know. I'm going to minister to your faith a little bit. This is what you should know, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. This isn't a closed book for a few people. This is an open book. God's made it plain to everybody. For no prophecy or portion of Scripture has ever come about by the will of man, but as holy men of God spoke as they were moved on, breathed on by the Holy Spirit. Don't you know, Timothy said, for all Scripture is given by God. Listen to this. And it is useful to teach us not only what is true, but to make us realize what is wrong in our everyday lives. The truth is we don't read the Word because we don't want to know what's wrong. We don't like God in our stuff. We don't like God in our vices. We don't like God in our money. We don't like God in our business. We don't like God in our thoughts. God, you stay at church on Sunday because every time your word shows up in my everyday life in all these areas that the preacher just named, you start showing me some areas that are wrong and we've got to come back to the truth that the manna from heaven is given to correct us when things are wrong and to also teach us what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people so that we can live and operate with good works. That's what the Bible says. Look at this. Here's one we don't hear preached anymore. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study the Word of God to show yourself to prove a workman that needeth not be ashamed that knows how to rightly divide the Word of truth. You want to know what that means in 21st century? language that means if you'll get in that word and study that word and grow in that word and become experienced in that word you'll know where to apply that word when your life's jacked up you'll know where to apply that word when your marriage is on the rock you'll know where to apply that word when you're struggling financially you'll know where to apply that manna from heaven every day over the parenting issues of your household 
I better preach over here to Pastor Chad. They're not, they mad at me this morning. <laughs> Number five, I'm going to let you go. I'm circling the air, airport here. This builds our faith when we walk through this process. This builds our trust in God's daily provision as we rely on God's daily provision in our lives. i got to share this, this, this last scripture with you. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. I never hear anybody preach this. And we have such trust through Christ towards God. I want to ask you something. Do you have that trust, Annie? Like, like do you know as a... It's, I'm not, not being messy. You have a son, right? Daughter. Two. Your road. It's been a difficult road. You've parented alone. Is that okay to say? I'm sorry. Do you know when you wake up today that if you don't have confidence in nobody else, that you have you should wake up according to the scripture with confidence through Christ towards God? That when you look to God, He's not fault-finding. He's not nitpicking your life. He's not mad at you. He's not being skeptical of you. He's not saying, well, you could have done that a little better. We have such confidence towards God through Christ alone. Check this out. Here's what Paul said. Not that our sufficiency or our confidence was based upon ourselves. Check this out. But our sufficiency is when the door flung open this morning. I knew my God already provided for my needs. I didn't wake up looking for snow in the driveway. I woke up looking for God's provision in my marriage. God's provision in my money. God's provision in my body. God's provision in my children. Even when it seems like the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the politics of the world have lost their mind. Even when it seems like nation is rising against nation. Even when it seems like my friend didn't answer my text message or I got a D-friend update on Facebook about how they dropped out of my life. What I knew this morning when I woke up is I have confidence towards and through Christ to my God that He needs me. He sees my needs. He longs for me. He's provided for me. Watch this. You ready? And there's a quota that I got up today needing to get from him. I don't have it all together. I still got needs in my life. There are quotas that need to be met today. But I know he's already sent them because he loves me. Watch this. Where'd we start this sermon series? Matthew 6, 33. It's exactly where we're going to end. So for this reason, what I just preached for you, wake up every morning and seek first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness and the rest of this mess will just be added to you as you operate and walk by faith on this life's journey road. You want to know why? There's the book in. Here's the beginning. Seek first the kingdom. (laughs) Blessed be the God and Father, Ephesians 1 and 3, of my Lord Jesus Christ who has, past tense, blessed me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places when he gave me Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That there's no special hallway in heaven, no special janitorial closet where God's keeping some extra blessing. And you're like, hey, God, I wish you would send me the rest of what you were going to give me. When he gave you his son, he gave you the best that he had. He gave you freedom from addiction. He gave you a new way of thinking. He gave you peace in your soul. He gave you kindness in your marriage. He gave you zeal in your relationship and in your witness he gave you everything he had when he gave you the gift of his son and what the enemy wants to keep you from having is faith in his provision his son the manna from heaven what he wants to do is clog your ears with all the clutter and voices of this world so you can hear the spirit saying what the bread of heaven would say because if he loses the ability to be in you or speak to you then you're lost on your journey. Hey, how'd I get to Orinoco? How'd I get to Pine Island? And then you're like, I don't even know if there is a Pine Island. I don't even know if I can be sober. I don't even know if I can be happy. I don't even know if I'm supposed to be married. I don't even know if I'm supposed to like women. I don't even supposed to. Because the enemy severed the provision from heaven in your life. 
Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. Stand with me on your feet. Did you get anything from that? Get anything from God today? Mm. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I just trying to do my best to show the church through your word many reasons, many examples of how we need to be daily dependent upon you. Father, I'm also trying to do my best under your anointing preaching to reveal to people your provision, that you love them, that you're not mad at them. Father, today it's my prayer in this room that men and women would say, you know what? I'm ready to unclog some of the voices in my ears. I'm ready to start feeding again on that manna from heaven that that not only tastes good, but actually is good for me. Father, as your word comes, as your spirit comes, show us those areas of immaturity. Show us those areas of inconsistency. Show us those areas where things are right, things are well, and things are whole. And then help us to carry on. Father, it's my prayer today that every man, woman, boy, and girl under the sound of my voice would just reaffirm their covenant and their commitment to daily having a dependency upon you. I trust God as we go and seek, we will find you when we search for you with all of our hearts. May our faith deepen. May our roots grow down stronger. May we soar unto new heights and may your blessings be in and on each and every one of our lives in christ's name i pray amen and amen